Matija Ronensteiger that came from Ben Gurion University. So uh, Ronan, he did his uh, bachelor, master, and uh, PhD at the School of Physics in Tel Aviv University. And then he went to Princeton University to, to make his postdoc, right? Yeah. I don't know if it's a slide for you. Uh, Michael Berry. Um. Yeah. Okay, and then since 2006, he's in the Life Science Institute in Bashar Thank you, thank you, Anna, for inviting me, and uh, thank you for uh, showing up. I understood that there was a, a tough competition because Daniel Kahneman was giving a lecture at the same time, and I really, uh, um, it's really excites me from the confidence that you um, showed that just coming here and not going to Daniel Kahneman uh, <coughs> talk. So I'll work on, uh, I'll uh, speak today about visual uh, search in the artifice, just uh, to thank uh, my collaborators. So the work today that I'll, I'm going to present is, uh, was done by three people. So Mo Bentov, Shai Gavai, and Tali Lebovich. This is uh, mainly their uh, uh, PhD works. And um, so a little bit of, a few words of outline. What I'll try to do today is uh, to tell you basically two stories. Um, the first one is visual search uh, of moving targets in the artifice, and I'll uh, uh, describe to you first the, uh, what is visual silency and uh, the behavior of the, of the fish, and then I'll, g I'll try to uh, convince you that we can say something about the mechanism, that how uh, uh, this uh, uh, visual search task is performed. And uh, if uh, Anna will allow me, and uh, there's going to be enough time, then uh, I'll uh, uh, describe to you how fish uh, move their attention around uh, and whether uh, there are similarities uh, in the way that uh, attention is moved across uh, vertebrates. And this is actually uh, what I'll try to show is that there is inhibition of return in the artificial. So these are the two stories that I'll try to speak today. Um, so what is the artificial? Artificial is a fish, and it's a, about this size. And what it's famous for is uh, its ability to shoot down insects that rest above water on uh, foliage. And uh, the way the fish do it, it's actually... Um, it uh, uh, spit a jet of water from the mouth that hits the insect and then the insect can fall into the water and the fish can feed on it. Now the cool uh, thing about uh, uh, this fish is that it, you can actually uh, train the fish to uh, shoot instead of uh, an insect that uh, um, hang on, uh, on uh, foliage, to shoot, uh, to, you can train the fish to shoot at the computer monitor, and then you have actually the uh, fish equivalent of a monkey or a human that sits in front of a computer monitor and reports its uh, uh, psychophysical uh, uh, decisions and perception by shooting at the right target. Now, the good thing about the, the fish is that actually it uh, represents uh, an animal that has um, a nice and tractable uh, visual behavior, but, si but still it has a very uh, different uh, brain anatomy from the uh, brain anatomy that we use to work with uh, mammals. And then what you can do is something like uh, you can ask how uh, similar the visual processing is across vertebrate. Okay, so this is something that you, uh, uh, you can do with this fish. And... Um, uh, one thing to keep in mind, this is a picture of the fish brain from above, uh, and what I want you to keep in mind is that fish do not have a fully developed, uh, hey, a fully developed uh, um, uh, cortex. They have optic tectum, which is the major uh, region in the brain where they uh, process visual information, and the optic tectum actually corresponds to the superior colliculus in, uh, uh, in mammals, and uh, this is going to be the focus of uh, and the work that I'm going to present at the first part. Uh, all the work that I present here was done by Mo Bentov, uh, an excellent uh, PhD student. And um, okay, so the first thing just to show you how the fish uh, behave in semi-natural environment. So we see the fish is sitting here and it's shooting at a cockroach that it sits above water. And if it doesn't work, you can always try to uh, use other measures. Um, okay, let's see it again. Okay. So the cockroach is here, and you can see that the fish can c continuously spit <laughs> until it gets it somewhere or not. Okay, so what is a visual search? Visual search is um, actually one of the most important things that the visual system uh, needs to do, is actually to find objects that are interested that are uh, interesting to the animal over some uh, background. And uh, basically, the target can differ uh, from the background in terms of 
some basic visual uh, features such as color and shapes and motion. And this is actually the information that the visual system can use in order to uh, understand, in order to actually to identify the object in the environment. Now, uh, I can actually give you some uh, visual search task, and this is the famous uh, uh, Where is Waldo um, task, and you can try to see it. Uh, this is Waldo. Well, it's very hard. I couldn't. It's here. Okay? So, there, this is definitely an object that is different from the rest of the objects in the uh, visual environment, and bus but this is, of course, a very hard uh, uh, visual task. Now, if you go to the literature and ask, okay, so what is known about types of uh, uh, visual search, then what you'll find out is basically people talk about two uh, visual search modes. The first one is what is called pop-out, and pop-out is something that really pops out from the uh, environment, and this is something that can be e either attributed to shape or some basic shape difference from the uh, background or some color difference from the background. And what is characterized uh, apart from the fact that it's really, uh, uh, you have the feeling you immediately find the old ball target is the fact that if you look on the reaction time, the time that takes to a subject to find the uh, old ball target, then uh, it's actually constant as, as the number of distractors in the environment increases. So this is a pop-out uh, um, um, this is a pop-out uh, uh, kind of uh, type of uh, visual search. Another way of, uh, uh, that you'll find out in the literature is conjunction search, which is actually something more complicated, where the oddball target is differs by more than one dimension, or at least usually more than one dimension of the uh, basic features or basic visual features. And what happens, uh, the target here, you can try to find the oddball target. Uh, it takes time. I, th I think I didn't do it the first time. I think this is the oddball target because this is the only orange uh, square and the only uh, square uh, orange object. Okay, so this is the oddball target. And if you look on the reaction time as the number of distractor increases, then the number of uh, the reaction time actually goes up as the number of distractors. And this, there is a quite a, 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 a quite nice distinction between these two type of uh, uh, visual search modes. Okay, so how the uh, visual search uh, is believed to uh, uh, be worked out in, the, in mammals is something like that. So we all know uh, about the work of Hubel and Wiesel, and we all know that there is some uh, uh, tuning to uh, orientation of uh, uh, bars, let's say, in, uh, uh, in V1. And basically, the, the idea is that if we have tuning to orientation and we have something like that, we have an oddball target and targets around it, what, what we could uh, um, say is something like that. There are cells that are going to respond to uh, this target and there are cells that are going to respond to this target. So basically, these two populations of cells are going to uh, report to higher visual error about what happens in the uh, outside visual environment. But when we try to combine these two maps of cells that respond to uh, targets with different orientation, what we get is something which is very similar to what we start with. So there is no, uh, uh, no map that actually reports about the salency or conspicuency of, some of, the, of one of the targets uh, um, in the presence of the background. So how this problem was solved? So this was solved during the 90s when people found out that there are actually properties of the, uh, visu the um, visual, proper, uh, visual functional properties of cells in V1 actually uh, reflect to uh, sometimes what happens outside of the receptive field, the classical receptive field. So the idea is something very simple. You find the receptive field of the cell and then you show outside of its classical receptive field objects. And this was done by uh, Knerin and Van Essen. And what they found out is something like that. This is a, an example of a cell. And this cell, uh, you have a condition where you have uh, just you show the bar. It, re, uh, it, uh, it responds some in some with some with some uh, with some burst of activity. And then you have the same bar either uh, uh, in the presence of bars that agrees with the orientation of the bar that you place within the receptive field, or disagree with the orientation the, uh, of the bar that you place within the receptive field. And what they found out is that uh, this particular cell, when you have uh, a bar that is in disagreement with the bars around the, recept around, uh, the receptive field, then you have a very high response. 
Okay, and this is something that actually, uh, uh, in contrast to the um, to the condition where you have the bar in the same orientation as, this, uh, as the bars around it, and then you have a very low response, and then what they say is something like that. Okay, so we have cells in the uh, in V1 that actually reports by a higher uh, um, firing rate about what happens outside of the receptive field, and if this, and what happens outside of the receptive field is in disagreement, it's, it actually, it has some contrast of orientation with what is going on within the receptive field, then the cell fires a lot, and this is actually what they call, they call these cells orientation contrast, and they found out that uh, a large fraction of cells in the, um, uh, in V1, of this, I think this is the cat, a uh, large fraction of cells really uh, report about this orientation contrast. Okay, so this is um, this is an example. Uh, this, if we go back to this uh, uh, Ubel and uh, Weasel story, then actually it needs to be modified because what happens is that we have cells that uh, um, reports when there is a di disagreement with what, between what happens within the receptive field and what happens outside of the receptive field. Basically, we have cells actually that reports uh, in a stronger activity. And if you try to combine this map and this map you will have a saliency map that looks like that, where you have a cell that actually uh, responds best because of what happens outside of its receptive field. Okay, so this is the idea of saliency map. Now, uh, one, uh, and this actually, this map can actually be reported to higher visual processing, where uh, a simple mechanism as winner take all can actually uh, be uh, used as a decision uh, uh, mechanism to decide which one of the target here is the old ball target. Okay, so this is uh, what you'll find in the literature. One, uh, just to uh, work it out, um, ET in 1998 uh, formalized all this uh, uh, nice story. Um, what they say is something like that. You have the visual environment. The visual system actually uh, decompose the uh, visual environment into different maps, and these maps are uh, then com uh, combined by some uh, linear combination into a single saline map saliency map, and then this actually drives the decision. In their case, that the decision was where to move your eye in order to find the uh, salient features in the environment. And of course, uh, later on, it was actually used in uh, many applications uh, uh, of uh, uh, visual uh, embedded uh, system. Okay, so this is the idea. The last thing that I would like to mention about that, so, so far I talked with you about uh, uh, motion, about uh, contrast uh, between bars uh, where you have the old ball bar just uh, be oriented with the respect of the others. Uh, we have also other types of uh, uh, pop-out. An example is presented here where you have a motion pop-out. You have a one old ball, and I don't need to explain to you what is the old ball. You just find it yourself. And uh, again, uh, how this thing can work out, uh, Kastner et al. in uh, 1999, uh, what they have done, they uh, reproduced the, um, uh, the previous work, uh, but now with uh, targets that actually move uh, in opposite directions. So here you have uh, uh, what happens in the receptive field. You have a bar, and then you, with uh, around the receptive field, the bar can move either uh, in the same phase or in the opposite phase. And what they found out, that there are cells that are presented here. There are cells that if the bar within the receptive field agrees with what happens outside of the receptive field, then the response is low. If the, there is disagreement in the motion uh, between the receptive field, within the receptive field and outside, then the uh, response is high, and they uh, call these cells motion contrast. And again, they found that a large fraction of cells within, uh, in V1 of the cat actually correspond to this type of, uh, uh, this type of behavior. Okay, so this is, uh, um, uh, this is the, the introduction. Now we go back to uh, what interests us. So what we know is that different animals have different uh, brain structure. Uh, humans and, and mammals use the visual cortex. Fish actually use the main visual area, which is the optic tectum, but still they need to solve similar uh, visual tasks, okay? You need to search for food, you need to escape from uh, uh, predators. And um, just in, in, uh, in keeping in mind the celebrated uh, Jovansky uh, statement from 1973 that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution, what we have decided to do is to ask, okay, so how visual uh, search is done in the archerfish, and we hope to actually to say something to see whether uh, there are similarities in the way that uh, um, this this cascade uh, is behaving with respect to the second one, and um, and uh, the basic 
question is, okay, so there are similarities in the visual search, how it is done, both in the level of behavior and both in the level of the mechanism. Okay, so this is the idea. And if you try uh, to use uh, your primate uh, brain to uh, devise an experiment, what you'll try, you, you first do is to do something like orientation pop-out, where you have something like that. You have a fish, and uh, you show the fish some odd ball, which is a bar which is oriented with the other balls. And then uh, you try to convince the fish that this is really the old ball, and it needs to find it. And this takes something like seven months. After seven months, there is nothing, uh, because the fish doesn't care about what you show it. And uh, then we uh, uh, add some thinking, and uh, uh, we were talking with people around. And actually, after a meeting with uh, Joram Goodfoyne in uh, the Technion, uh, we came with the idea that actually these fish use uh, movement as a cue for uh, detecting uh, insects. Because if you look on, a, on just, uh, uh, you give it a cockroach, uh, the, the fish a cockroach target, then what you see is something like that. Uh, the fish is looking, and the cockroach is standing. But as soon as the cockroach is starting to move, then the, uh, the fish bang and uh, uh, try to shoot at the insect. This is, means that the fish, in their biology, they really use uh, motion as a cue for, uh, uh, and, uh, for making decisions. And what we have decided to do is to move to do actually motion pop up We have uh, several targets, and one of the targets is actually moving in the opposite, uh, uh, opposite phase. And we tested for motion saliency. Okay, so what I'll, uh, um, the experiment was pretty much like that. We show several targets. One of them is moving in the opposite direction or in uh, uh, the same, di uh, same direction, uh, sorry, opposite phase or the same phase, and it actually uh, can have uh, the same uh, speed as the rest of the, uh, of the rest of the target or a, a larger speed. And uh, the important thing is that uh, what we do is we play, uh, we show the fish this, uh, uh, um, uh, this, uh, uh, this set of targets, and we uh, do not, uh, um, uh, we, don't we don't enforce them any for to do any action. So they make their own decision, and we reward them after every shot, okay? Provided that the shot is actually on one of the targets. Yes, the one. Are all the targets moving relative to some background, so that there's also, all of them are perceived as moving, or is there just relative motion of this one special target? So all of them moving. You, you'll see it in, uh, in a minute. All of them are moving with respect to the environment, okay? And uh, basically, we have tried to, do, to use two types of stimuli. One of them is moving bar like that, and the other one is moving a bore patches that I'll, I think I'll, I'll, I won't show you. Uh, and what we, um, what we found out, I'll show you in a minute, is that actually there is exist motion saliency and pop-out in both types of stimuli. So here is an example of an experiment. So the fish is here, OK? Oh, OK. This is the monitor. Now there is a cue that uh, tells the fish the experiment is going to start. Okay, this is the target, and you will see that the target is actually moving in the opposite phase and double the speed. These are the dist distractors. Uh, it's moving very slow. Yeah, now it's moving. Yeah, and you see the fish shoots. It's very hard to see it. Let's see it again. I think it's going to. Uh, there's some amount of uh, slow movement that the fish starts to ignore it? Uh, probably yes, but we haven't, we haven't tried it yet. Okay. Yeah, and again. Okay, so the important thing is that they have to select what is actually salient for them. Okay, we don't, we, we reward them every <laughs> for every shot. Okay, so we don't have any... Uh, we don't make any uh, uh, bias. And we can ask, is there a motion uh, pop-out in the archerfish? So that the first thing to, to, to test is ba basically uh, the, whether the uh, oddball target is indeed salient to the uh, fish visual system. And the way to uh, decide about that, you just look on what uh, fraction of time the fish selected the uh, oddball target in shooting it. And what you see is this is the, um, this is the, the, this is the result. We have number of destructors of four, six, and eight. We have chance value, and what you see is that basically that the fish selected the uh, oddball target uh, by far above uh, the chance value. This means that motion basically is a silent feature for the archer fish. 
Now what you can ask is whether it's really, it's not just salient, whether actually it shows also pop-out properties, which means that you uh, should look for the uh, reaction time of number of distractors. And what we found out is that the reaction time is roughly constant as a function of the number of distractors. And this means that there is a, uh, this is actually an evidence for a motion pop-out in the uh, arch fish. Okay, so this is, uh, uh, this is the first result. Now, what I've shown you basically is that if, you, uh, if we move the uh, oddball target with the opposite phase and a larger speed, then we found out that there is actually a pop-out uh, uh, effect. What we, we can ask now is what about the other uh, possibilities? We can actually work with the same uh, phase uh, motion and uh, just uh, with a larger speed, or we can use actually just the, the same speed but with uh, the opposite uh, phase. So uh, what we found out is something like that. If we um, rechange, we, we use the same the same uh, uh, target uh, speed, and uh, uh, we just change the uh, the phase. Th what we found out is that uh, there is actually saliency for the six and the four uh, uh, the six and four condition in number of distractors, but for four con uh, so, sorry in six and eight condition uh, as number of distractors, but in the four condition the uh, response uh, uh, to the uh, oddball target is not um, uh, significantly above chance level. Okay, so this is uh, the first observation. Now, if we uh, keep the phase uh, for all the targets and we uh, increase the uh, the speed, then Immediately what we found out is that this is actually a salient uh, uh, and pop-out uh, behavior in the uh, illicit uh, salient and pop-up behavior in the archfish. What you see is that the, uh, the response, uh, the, the, the success rate of uh, selecting the oddball target is uh, uh, well above chance level and the uh, reaction time is constant as the number of destructors. And again, the result of just show you that the number of destructors uh, uh, doesn't change the uh, reaction time, and uh, there is well above chance level of uh, reaction uh, of success rate when uh, the uh, phase is opposite and we have larger target. Okay, so basically if we go back here, then what we found out is that uh, when the phase is the same for the uh, old ball target, but the, sp uh, the speed is uh, higher, then we still get a pop-out effect. Uh, here we uh, we don't know yet, it, and I put an X here, but uh, it seems that there is actually an additivity uh, of the uh, re in the reaction of the fish that the more uh, uh, the more dimensions that you change um, in the uh, in the problem, then the, it's easier for the fish to uh, respond, and uh, it moves actually uh, to faster and, uh, and, and more accurate responses. Okay, so this is the uh, behavioral uh, story. Now to um, uh, uh, just to, um, to finish the story, what I uh, need to show you is that actually I can break the system because what we found out is that the number of uh, uh, the response time is constant as number of distractors. What we can do is now we can ask whether we can break the system and enforce the fish to uh, move into a, a serial or complex uh, uh, search, uh, search mode. And this was done with the following uh, stimulus. What we have done is we uh, present the fish with uh, uh, several targets. One of them has bulges on the, uh, on the disk. And now you, uh, um, you basically what we need to do is, of course, to explain the fish that this is the right target. And this is really easy. After two days of uh, showing these targets and rewarding it only when it shoots on, uh, uh, the, uh, on, on this disk, then it understands that this is the right, uh, and the right thing to do. And what we found out is that the reaction time as number of destructors is actually uh, going up and the slope is significantly greater than zero, okay? So basically, it, it shows that you can actually uh, induce the archerfish to move into a different search mode, which is actually uh, serial, and this is in contrast to what happened earlier, where the fish was using uh, um, uh, something that looks like parallel, because the number of destructors doesn't uh, change the uh, reaction time. Does it mean serial? Serial, it means that if you, um, okay, so, uh, I think maybe the word, I, I think, I, I really like the word complex, not because there is, yeah. Sorry? Is 
Yeah, so the, okay, so initially we were trying to do just showing them the targets and, and they just, they, they, they didn't understand this is the old ball at all. Okay, so this was the first observation. We still decided, okay, so can we make them understand that this is an old ball? Then we reward only after they uh, shot at the old ball. And then what we found out is that there actually, uh, you increase the number of these structures and the reaction time increases. Okay, in a similar way that if you uh, do the experiment with humans with conjunction search, then the, uh, the reaction time goes up as the number of distractors increases. Okay? Okay, so what we found so far is that uh, motion is the silent feature for the artifice and it uses, it looks like uh, um, two uh, modes of search. One of them is parallel because uh, the number of distractors do not influence the um, the, uh, uh, the reaction time and then you have a pop-out effect and the other one is serial because you really need to uh, move from target to target, or the word complex is maybe uh, better because then the fish actually uh, uh, does uh, pay attention to the fact that you have more distractors and this actually increases the uh, response time. Now, uh, and we, what we found out was also in the uh, moving targets experiment is that the performance depends on the motion features. If we give more information to the fish, then uh, the uh, reaction, time, um, uh, reaction time and success rate goes up. Um, okay, so now we can ask what is the mechanism for motion pop-out in the outer fish. And to do that, what we need to do is actually go and record from the fish brain. So we have developed a system to, um, that enables us to uh, maintain a fish in a small uh, water tank and actually record from the optic tectum uh, after, um, after doing the right uh, surgery. And the first thing to do is, of course, to characterize what uh, the, are the functional properties of uh, um, cells in the, uh, in the optic tectum. So just a brief overview of what we have, uh, have tried to do. We uh, showed uh, um, um, bars with uh, different orientation and, uh, so, uh, and looked whether there are uh, orientation uh, selective cells in the, uh, in, the, um, in the artificial optic tectum in response to flashing bars. What we found is that you can find actually cells uh, um, on the continuum between orientation selective cells where you have a very strong response to uh, one bar and a very uh, weaker response to uh, bars that are in the null direction, in the null orientation, or cells that do not care about the uh, orientation of the bar. So we, you can actually call these cells orientation selective, these are non-orientation selectives, and you can actually characterize the uh, functional properties according to this way. Uh, basically what we found is that 58 percent of the cells were orientation selective in the archer fish optic tectum and uh, the preferred orientation had a strong bias for the vertical orientation, a cell like that that actually likes uh, bars uh, that are standing like that. Okay, so this is the first observation. The second observation is to uh, actually take the bar and move them across the receptive field and what we found out is that you can actually classify cells to roughly three uh, uh, cell classes uh, we have cells that are orientation selective, meaning that they respond well if the bar is moving in one direction and or in the other direction, which is the opposite direction, then actually uh, a cell responds well for things that are moving in one axis. There are direction selective cells for cells that really like uh, for movement from uh, in one direction uh, from the eight uh, directions that we have selected, and there is a group of non-direction selective cells. Okay, so these are really the um, uh, the basic functional properties that uh, you can find, and 50% of the cells were either orientation or direction selective uh, in the artificial uh, optic tectum. And again, there is a strong bias for the vertical orientation and direction. Okay, so this is uh, what you need to know at this stage about uh, and, uh, um, about the optic tectum of the artifice. Just mid summary for this part, there are similarities between functional properties of cells in the optic tectum in the fish and visual complex uh, cortex in mammals. Okay, we all know about the story about uh, Uvil and Weasel. And now we can ask where do uh, saliency maps exist in the artificial visual system and whether actually uh, there are saliency maps in the artificial opti uh, optic tectum. In order to do that, what you do is we do is basically we reproduce the experiment that was done with cats. We find receptive field and then we uh, just place a bar within the receptive field and move it around. And then we do two other conditions. Uh, one condition is where you have a bar within the receptive field and bars outside of the receptive field that are moving uh, at the same phase 
uh, and the same speed with the bar within the receptive field and a condition where you have a motion contrast where the, uh, there is a disagreement in the motion between the, what happens within the receptive field and outside of the receptive field. Okay, and this is uh, uh, what we found. What we found is that indeed we can find cells that actually uh, if you um, show them um, a stimulus and now uh, what you see on the top is the, actually the stimulus, how it's, uh, what is the phase of the stimulus, basically what is the bar position within the receptive field. And on the, uh, on the left, you can, find, you can see what was the condition. If all the, uh, all the bars were moving with the same phase, then uh, this is uh, uh, actually uh, depicted in uh, light green. If the bar within the receptive field is moving with the opposite phase of the rest of the bars, this is depicted uh, with uh, a light blue. And what we, you see is basically that when the cell, um, um, when what happens within the receptive field, uh, then you have basically uh, some response, and when you have uh, move things around outside of the receptive field, you have a very uh, different uh, response. And you, you can actually summarize this uh, very uh, uh, different uh, firing rate in just a single number. If you just count the number of spikes that you get in uh, the motion contrast condition versus the uh, non-motion contrast condition, what you find out is that actually the firing rate increases uh, uh, dramatically when you have a motion contrast between what happens within the receptive field and outside of the receptive field. And this is just uh, an one example of a cell. This is another example of a cell. Basically, what this actually shows you that there are cells that actually report about the uh, motion contrast uh, 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 within the artificial uh, optic tectum. What you can do, the next thing to do is basically you can ask, okay, so I have the uh, stimulus which is actually, um, um, the stimulus is actually uh, um, uh, periodic and you can actually can collap collapse the response of uh, uh, each neuron to a single uh, phase of uh, a single cycle of the um, a single cycle of the stimulus, and what you uh, see is something that just uh, um, make the uh, the uh, previous uh, picture more clear. You have uh, uh, the cell here. You have the condition where it's uniform or the the condition where it's contrast. You really get more uh, spikes from uh, where you have motion contrast, and this is for both cells that uh, within this uh, uh, within this example. Okay, so what you can ask, okay, so uh, this is, uh, I've shown you that uh, uh, there are uh, cells that report about the motion uh, contrast. How uh, large are they in the population? The answer is that there are actually a huge number of uh, uh, cells, about 45% of the cells in the artificial optic tectum can uh, uh, respond to motion uh, contrast, and this really brings us to the conclusion uh, that cells in the optic tectum can serve as saliency uh, maps for pop-out behavior in the artifice. Okay, so let me summarize this uh, uh, part of the work. Uh, what we show is that motion uh, is a silent feature for the artifice, and basically there is existence for a motion pop-out in the artifice, and this is, uh, I think, one of the first uh, evidence for uh, existence of uh, a pop-out uh, um, visual uh, search mode in uh, lower vertebrate. And uh, what we show also is that single cells in the optic, uh, artificial optic tectum show motion contrast behavior, and this actually group of cells can uh, form a saliency map to the uh, similar one to the one that was uh, uh, proposed in the mammalian case as uh, uh, the way to um, the way to explain uh, the results uh, uh, with humans and, and primates. Now, uh, one thing is left here before we can actually go and uh, try to publish it, and uh, uh, this is. What I've shown you is that there is an additivity uh, across dimensions of uh, uh, visual, proper uh, visual properties in the behavioral level. Now what we can try to do is go to the, uh, again to the uh, electrophysiology lab and see whether we see this behavior also in the activity of single cells. If this is going to be, uh, if this is going to turn out to be correct, then this is going to be a really cool thing because we can actually um, make a convincing case that these cells uh, indeed participate in the um, um, uh, motion pop-out in the artifice. Okay, so I think that I have a few more minutes to uh, actually switch gear and talk about uh, in few slides. Can I yes. Ask a yes. Uh, it's a somewhat technical question, and maybe you even said that. Yeah. Sometimes the results show that the receptive field of these cells is huge, right? I mean, they respond to something happening all over. So how did you define? Okay, so the. Place, right? 
the, the problem is, of course, maybe in the definition of receptive field, okay? So you have the classical receptive field is that uh, you find it with the bar, okay? You just move bar around, yeah, and this is really confined um, to a very small region, and you can actually uh, uh, put it on the, uh, on the monitor, and really the cell responding for a bar only within a confined region. Okay, and then you, what you find out is actually it also uh, responds to things that happen outside of, the, of this region. Okay? No, no, the, uh, in the behavioral experiment, of course, you've seen it. Uh, in the uh, electrophysiology, uh, it's awake. It's a small water tank with a, a life supporting system. So it won't swim away and won't, won't move and we insert an electrode to the optic tectum and it actually sees a monitor in front of it. Okay, so it's immobilized, but uh, because, because it's, it's being held by some, um, some device that doesn't allow it to move. Okay, yeah. So you said that if you stimulate outside the receptive field, they also can have some response? No, if you... Uh, I, I this is actually the, the, the question of Yoram. If you stimulate, if you stimulate within the receptive field, the, uh, actually the cells pay attention to what happens also outside of the classical way of, uh, uh, of finding the receptive field. Try just to stimulate the surroundings? Yes, we have, uh, we have done that. What, what you find out is that our uh, cells, if you don't have the thing inside, then you usually you don't see anything. Okay. This is, uh, but uh, the, the problem, with, and th I think this is a problem in neuroscience, is that every person has a cell. You invent now a cell, and I'll find, I'll go to the to the group of cells, and I'll find something that will be similar like, like that. Okay, but uh, the majority of cells really uh, react the way that I have shown you. So, 45% of the cells are really like the cells that I have just shown. You, okay. Um, okay, so what is inhibition of return? Inhibition of return was found out uh, in humans many years ago, and the, the, it's really a very simple story. You have some uh, fixation frame, and uh, subjects are asked to be uh, to fixate at, uh, at the center, and then you have some cue, and uh, after the cue disappears, and after some time uh, there is a target. Okay, and the cue can be either on the same side as the target or on the opposite side. Okay, so basically it can be either a valid uh, queue for the target or an invalid queue for the target. And of course, you randomize everything, so basically the queue doesn't really tell you about what happens about uh, the target. But then, uh, Posner and Klein, uh, uh, what they've shown is, there is actu actually there is a transition. So if um, um, uh, they measure basically reaction time as the time between the um, uh, disappearance of the queue and the onset of the target. And what they found is that uh, for the queue target, for the target that appears on the same uh, location um, uh, as the queue, initially uh, people respond very fast to the queue target and later on they start to respond uh, uh, with larger latencies with la larger reaction times. But if you look on the, tar the target that was on uh, uh, the opposite, uh, uh, opposite side, then initially the uh, reaction time to this target is high, and, but then it goes down, 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 and never comes, comes up. Okay, so basically what they, they claim is actually um, uh, in this experiment that what happens is that the subjects are fixating here and there is a queue. And what happens is that initially their attention is moving with respect to the queue, and if something happens uh, very shortly afterwards, then they react very fast because their attention is over there, okay? Now they come back, okay? And if they come back, now they have inhibition of returning to the same location where their attention b visited l uh, lately, and therefore they actually react very s uh, slower for uh, things that appears later on on the same location. So this, th this thing was uh, called inhibition of return, and... Because uh, what happens is that attention is drawn away, it comes back, and then you're actually uh, symmetric with respect to the uh, you go you go back to the naive to the naive uh, uh, to the naive um, um, reaction time. Okay. So this this was the observation, and uh, it was discovered in 1984, the first uh, uh, paper, and then there were many years of uh, working on this uh, uh, on this subject, basically on humans and primates on, on, and monkeys. And the question is, um, is there in inhibition of return outside of the primate or even the mammalian lineage? And 
Uh, actually, if you go to the literature, what you find out is that uh, there are no reports about that. And the reason, the first reason is, of course, that uh, focus of attention is something that is really, really hard to measure. And uh, another thing is that uh, some aspect of attention is uh, believed to be located in the cortex. So there is actually no need to uh, work on animals without cortex, like fish, because if attention is located there, then they don't have something like that. And uh, there is also, uh, but if you, if you look further about, uh, uh, about the literature, then what you find is that our indication that inhibition of return is reduced in humans with lesions in the superior colliculus. And this is really good news because if the superior colliculus plays uh, an, um, a role in inhibition of return and the optic tectum of the fish is actually the evolutionary counterpart of the superior colliculus, then it might be that there is inhibition of return also in fish. And uh, what actually uh, it can tell you is it can tell you something about the minimal circuits that produce can produce this behavior. If you find something like that in fish, then it might be that if you have uh, optic tectum, then this is sufficient for uh, uh, inhibition of return. Okay, so what we have done, we just reproduced the classical experiment with humans. We have, again, a fixation, uh, uh, two, two targets that tell the fish, uh, and they just flash on the screen, they tell the fish, uh, the experiment is about to start, and then you have uh, 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 the queue, which can be either on the same location or on the opposite location of the target. The queue disappears, and sometimes afterwards, which is varied, between 200, 700 and uh, uh, 1300 uh, milliseconds, the target appears and the fish needs to shoot on the target. Just to make sure that we're all on the same, on the same page. So we have a condition where the uh, queue is valid. We show the fixation that tells the fish uh, now something is starting. Then we have a queue and then the target can appear on the same location of the queue. Or in the invalid queue condition where we have the queue on the opposite location where the target will be uh, will appear later on and then what you can do is you can actually uh, measure response time and what you'll find out is that when you have uh, the valid meaning that the queue tell you something about uh, um, tell you something about the target then uh, initially the response time of the fish is low and then later on it comes it goes up and uh, in, the in the condition where you have an invalid condition where the uh, queue appears on the opposite direction uh, opposite location to the target then the reaction time goes down as uh, w was found out with humans so this is actually an indication for inhibition inhibition of return in fish this is actually the first demonstration of inhibition of return outside of primates and um, uh, there was uh, uh, um, it, it's kind of uh, interesting that uh, in the psychology literature there was a, a huge discussion whether inhibition of return is actually a, a good think uh, if you uh, from the ecological point of view because if you search the environment then you don't want to waste uh, um, uh, waste time on on, on locations that you have been uh, visited lately lately so actually inhibition of return may uh, be uh, some way to optimize the uh, usage of uh, uh, brain resources in order to uh, look at the environment so this was uh, there was a discussion of course if we believe that inhibition of return has some ecological benefit then you should some find something like that in uh, lower vertebrates and this is also uh, some indication it's not a proof but about the minimal secretory needed for inhibition of return so the major uh, visual uh, area in the, in the fish is the optic tectum, which corresponds to superior colliculus. So in, it might be that the superior colliculus really plays a major role uh, in uh, eliciting this behavior. Uh, I think that's it for now. Just uh, again to thank my uh, collaborators. So Mo Bentov was doing uh, the first uh, part of the work. Uh, of uh, visual search in the atrophy, Shagabai and Tali Leibovich were uh, part uh, of, were actually running the uh, second part together with Avishai Enik from uh, the psychology department in BGU. And thank you uh, for listening. Okay, that's a good thing. If you go to the literature, you will find out all sorts of uh, blocks, that, uh, and the blocks are something like, if I find a stroke here, what happens to inhibition of return? And if I find a stroke here, what is, inhibition, what, what is, the, what is going on with the inhibition of return? And, and so it's basi basically uh, building blocks from, from this point of view. Which, which part of the, of the circuit I will damage 
and what happens on the for the inhibition of return. So uh, as, as far as I know, there is not too much work on the on the mechanism in uh, in, in in primates, although actually it does call for for some knowledge about about this. But as far as I know, there is not too much work. Yep. So you mentioned that the optics actually thought of as an equivalent of superior calibers rather than the cortex. Yeah. Um, no, this is this is this is. This is the most solid piece of, of this yeah, coming yeah. from neuroana okay. neuroanatomy. Neuroanatomy is, is yeah, a solid so science. So one question is, what yeah. do you know whether in superior colliculus there is pop-out? Uh, no, I don't know. Uh, actually, Avishai uh, proposed to do the experiment. I was uh, afraid from the technical, <coughs> uh, the technical uh, uh, aspect. The other question is yeah. about the receptive field. So you, you saw that, that you get receptive fields that are kind of similar to the concept of cortex. Yeah. If you try to, um, to quantify them more carefully, like, uh, you get more. Yeah, OK. So uh, the question is, did you run uh, white noise analysis to these cells? The answer is yes. And uh, what you find out is that, indeed, uh, we did not enforce ourselves on the... F on so you could ask something like that. You have tried to use uh, uh, moving bars, and maybe the moving bars, you read too many papers, and this is not the right thing to do. So what we have done, we have run uh, white noise analysis. I don't have it here. Uh, and you look on the uh, response, uh, responses, and indeed these cells have elongated receptive fields. Okay? And this is actually on the way to go. Uh, to continue to see whether you find cabors and, and okay. things like that. So they look like cabors or something like that? Uh, I didn't see cabor yet, but okay. it's definitely, the, it has the right shape. So um, uh, moving bar is the, the thing that's really uh, um, supposed to elicit the maximal response. And actually, there is a nice correspondence because you do this the experiment that I showed you the data for. and. The, uh, you run also the uh, white noise analysis and the orientation that you get from the uh, moving bar and orienting bar agrees well with the white noise analysis. So this, was, this thing, I think this, this piece, this piece of, of, uh, of evidence is, is quite convincing at the moment. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Have you tried something like breaking stimuli where you increase the size of it to see if you expression from outside the receptive field when you stimulate inside and outside? So grating, we have tried grating to to uh, understand the response properties and characterize the uh, spatial and temporal uh, uh, aspect of the responses. Okay, so you can find, you can you can actually tell me what what I found is because we found cells that behave like uh, low pass filters and band pass filters and high pass filters. That's that's uh, that's for sure. Uh, but we haven't tried yet the second part. Yeah, because actually yeah. this works on. That's that's correct. Yeah. 